just a bit of housekeeping um, before we kick off. Uh, obviously, it is a Zoom meeting. We do have about 70 people on the call. Um, so <coughs> please keep yourself on mute um, unless you need to ask a question. Um, you can take yourself off mute. Uh, you have the ability to certainly interrupt us if you need to. Um, if with any questions, we want to make this as conversational as possible. Um, and just in terms of if you did want to ask a question, yes, you can take yourself off mute. Uh, otherwise, there is a little chat box and you have the ability to raise your hand or type in a message and you can put that chat either into the whole group for everybody to see, or you can message one of us if you don't feel comfortable about asking the wider group. Um, in terms of, we're sort of hoping this will only take an hour, but yeah, feel free to jump off if you need to go, uh, if we do run over. But I would also just really like to introduce Malcolm Taylor, who we have on the call. Mal, if you want to give a wave, um, and Brian Dunn as well from the New South Wales DPI, if you want to give a wave. Uh, John Fowler, I hope you're there somewhere. I couldn't quite see you, <laughs> um, but he is also on the call somewhere. <laughs> uh, and then also you've obviously got Rice Extension staff. So my name's Annabelle. Um, I've hopefully met quite a few of you. Uh, in the Amaru room at Leeton, we've got Mark and M. if you both want to give a wave. Um, and then we've got Troy sitting on the call as well, if you want to give a wave, Troy. Beautiful. Um, all right. Em, do we want to jump into the next slide? Very good, thank you. So obviously everyone is experiencing the fact that it is really wet. Um, we've got a situation where a lot of people are planting rice on rice, just considering with paddocks, you know, you've got winter crop in and that's just the way that it worked out. So when we sort of Thinking about putting in rice, we sort of got these, these sort of two options that weigh against each other, which is sort of do you try and prepare paddocks as normal as can and hope that as the spring sort of gets warmer that you get onto paddocks and then slow a bit like a slow a bit later on, or do you sort of take some cuts with preparation so that you can actually get um, onto your paddocks and, and actually sow on time? Um, John Fowler, I was just wondering if you are there, did you have any further comments around? This one, obviously, this is a problem that you've experienced in the past. Yeah, morning. So I think your the flow chart that you're going to get to in a moment uh, covers most of it, really. I, I might make comments when we go through that, but at this point in time, um, there will be comments about the, the optimum selling time, and I think we need to uh, discuss that a little. Um, but, yeah, nothing at this point, Annabelle. Beautiful. All right. Well, if we go on to the next slide, M, and we'll just quickly touch over this. So I'm hoping, hoping everybody can see this. Sorry, it is quite um, hard to see, but we will split it up into sections as we move on so that we can sort of focus. Um, but as a team, when we got together, it was sort of like this is the wider view on how you make decisions because it's all well and good to sort of think, oh, it'll be right. But at the same time, getting actually try and actually be a little bit more proactive to think about how you're going to sort of look at what you're doing is going to be really important. Uh, so I will jump across to M and if M wants to kick off the part around stubble in particular. Yep. Um, so yeah, getting rid of stubble is obviously going to be the biggest challenge this year with it being so wet and high stubble loads from last year. Uh, so if you've got a green stubble and got other plants in there, uh, don't try and burn it because it'll lead to a bad burn. So you'll need to spray it out, um, which obviously is very hard when the paddocks are all wet. So chances are you're probably not going to be able to get out with your big sprayer. So maybe try and uh, use a smaller one that uh, less heavy and able to get on the paddocks because you'll probably, um, yeah, probably be able to get on a bit quicker anyway than waiting for your big one. And yeah, um, and then and then by then it should be brown once you've sprayed it out or if it's already uh, pretty free of plants and things. Um, yeah, next step is to burn your stubble, but make sure you wait for a good day to burn the stubble, otherwise you'll get a bad burn again. So really aiming for a really good burn so then you can, yeah, get on. Um, Malcolm, is there, Anything to be aware of with chemicals or 
Uh, got any ideas of the best chemicals to use? Been muted there. Um, look, it's classic uh, knockdowns of uh, glyphosate or paraquat uh, would be in order. You'd want to add some group G, something like carfentrazone or nail uh, or hammer to uh, speed up the burn down. Uh, you can't put paraquat on by air, but you can, I think, put glyphosate on air. I was just actually looking up the label then. So I'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, yeah. And Just quickly, Mal, what's the what's the advantages of um, paraquat or disadvantages between paraquat and glyphosate? Well, I could talk all morning. Um, paraquat's quick. Uh, yeah, it's not that's going the answer to, I was not, after. It's not system systemic, so you'll get regrowth afterwards on big weeds. Um, and of course, it's far more toxic. But it will get that that browning and a better burning quicker than than your glyphosate. That was what they first invented paraquat for. Artificial, artificial fire breaks. So now, if we've got a, a paddock of you know ryegrass has gone berserk and there's a heap of clover in a in a wet stubble, um, you know what what would be our and we're surrounded by flowering canola. Um, <laughs> give us a scenario. <laughs> um, uh, well, it sounds to me like you may not want to use a, a, uh, an aircraft uh, and uh, some ally will help, but I think there's a one month uh, plant back period on ally. Uh, or so you could put some dicamba in there uh, as well with, the, with glyphosate. And that would be glyphosate, dicamba, not a paraquat then? Yes. It, it, there is uh, on, it's probably more on um, fallow ground, but there is a problem arising of glyphosate resistant ryegrass uh, and paraquat will give you a burn, but it won't kill it. So there becomes, it's an opportunity for further research, but uh, in practical terms, uh, in what you described, it would be a glyphosate uh, dicamba mix uh, and you probably have to wait the, perhaps two weeks before you get a burn on. Yep. <clears throat> um, well, I suppose uh, some people have probably gone out, tried to burn their stubble and it hasn't ended up uh, getting a good burn. So what are our options then? Throwing it out there to anyone? Well, it's a disc plough. Yep. Peter, I'm going to Peter Burke. I'm going to drop you in here. Are you have you had any uh, just you know a, a burn that hasn't worked very well? Um, probably to the point we can't quite get a, a timed implement through it yet, especially windrows and stuff. What's what's your thoughts? Um, I've only had it in a couple of paddocks that were bogged up, which usually take. Um, you know, you can never get a perfect burn in them when it's wet anyway. So that's why I went ahead and did them anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah. Originally, um, originally I was going to just go back and tidy him up, with, or which we did do, but then it started to rain again. So I went out there to the power harrow and um, for two reasons. One, it's really good at getting rid of the stubble and two, gets rid of your bog marks at the same time. So... I did put a video on um, C23 of that last week. So that paddock is now, worst case scenario, ready to go. If I can't get back on it, it'll um, it'll get seed flowing into it and filled up. Um, preferably, I'll still play out and grow to water it and whatnot if we can, but, you know, it's probably looking less likely. Um, but, yeah, and then I've got, I've got a couple of blocks that are oh, probably 90% burnt. I'll probably go back around then with the um, mulcher and mulch the um, little bits and pieces that didn't burn and then um, tidy them up. So I'm not worried about, um, in a year like this, I'm not worried about the perfect burn. I think you're better off um, getting as much done as you can and then working with what you got to um, 
tidy those little pieces up, even if you mulch it and then if you're going to drill so, well, um, you know, it's kind of um, just do the best you can, really. Yeah. Can you comment? Yeah. So, yeah. <coughs> Anyone else have a comment or... Oh, good. Uh, it's it's Cameron Cork speaking. Um, I'm up here at Forbes. We're going to have a crack at growing a um, small block of rice up here this year. I do have a question. Uh, you talked about Group G's there a little minute ago and suggested hammer. My, one of my questions is, is sledge an option to use? Because we've got a lot of ryegrass there and I just felt that the sledge will give us, might give us a little bit more activity on the ryegrass than, um, than just, you know, than hammer, hammer doesn't seem to do much to the ryegrass. Uh, sledge is pyrofluoromethyl, and I don't think there's any plant back issues with that either. Yeah, so that'd be an option, right? Like... Yeah, I don't know whether it's going to help you on uh, ryegrass at all. But, uh... well, it's got ryegrass listed on its label. That's all. So small ryegrass, and that's what I'm dealing with. You know, three three leaf, one tiller type ryegrass that's out there at the moment that we've got to knock down once we can get onto it. You could get it before the flood comes. Yeah. Uh, this this country won't get flooded. Like it's wet, but it won't get flooded. Yeah. Yep. No worries. Um, yeah. So after you've got your stubble, obviously you're looking at your layouts and what sowing method you can choose from there. So uh, on to the next one. Right. Yeah. So we're so we're heading down two paths here. Um, obviously, burning the stubble for the uh, biggest impediment and getting the ground in some sort of condition. Uh, just the fact we've got uh, 84 people on this call at the moment, so at least 75 of them are growers. And um, uh, and every sort of, you know, we'd get a couple of calls a day here in the office, just uh, worried that they're not gonna get the rice in. They're hoping they're gonna get in. So it's obviously a huge issue for everybody. Um, so we, uh, yes, we certainly understand where you're coming from and, and, uh, and just, how to sort of uh, you know move forward from from where we're at. Um, opening that ground up is probably a big thing, and, and certainly open to any uh, opinions or experience that that you lot have had out there. As I say, there's 70, 80, nearly 80 growers on this call, so um, between you all, you've had uh, you've seen most of it. You've, you've experienced drought, you've experienced wet years. Um, 16 is pretty fresh in everyone's mind. Um, so, uh, so please don't hesitate to, you know, to share your experience with us all, I suppose. So, um, so we're, we're going to cover both aerial and drill. So just from the aerial side of things, um, you know, there's an option that I just want to about, and John, I'll probably, John Fowler, I'll probably call you in on here. If the ground's not too bad, we've had a decent burn, but we're not going to be able to get back on that ground again. It's just wet. Um, has anyone had an experience of, filling up and flying seed in. And uh, I know in 16, a few people did it, but uh, in the South particularly, but um, uh, but is there anyone on this call or, or has anyone seen it that uh, it, it's actually an option or are we better off to open that ground up and eliminate things and, uh, and, and prepare it properly? Yeah, Mark, I personally haven't seen that done. Um, it's probably worth trying, but Definitely use pre-germinated seed if you're going to do it. Um, pre-germination went out of favour for a while, but where we've done the, the demonstrations, pre-germinated is uh, incredibly superior to just using dry seed. It's quicker and you get more plants established. That would be my only comment. But for me in 2016, when it did dry out, the ground set that hard. That was the biggest problem I personally had was trying to get... Uh, trying to work the ground after it set hard. It'd been wet all winter and then when it dried out, it, it went like concrete. But if anyone else has got practical experience, I'd like to hear it. The comment, I'd make there, yeah. sorry, the comment I'd make there is that if you're going to do that, uh, try and get a knockdown on it before you flood it because barnyard grass would already be germinating now. And it's those early germinating barnyard grass that are always the hardest and most expensive to kill. Yeah. Yep. Good comment. Um, look, the probably priority is to open that ground up. Um, there's um, there's been a lot saying, look, I've opened it up and you get an inch of rain. What happens on that? 
Um, but if we don't open them up, we're never going to uh, get anywhere really. So uh, we've had uh, people that, you know, with big gear just can't get on it and they've, they've brought out the old um, inner scarifier and knocked it down to 19 times with, with narrow points just to, uh, just to open that ground up. Um, where windrows are left in, in, a, in a, you know, relatively okay burn, but didn't get the windrows properly. Uh, you know, we might have to cross those windrows or, or do something with it. I've heard of people in the past, uh, even getting hay rakes out to sort of turn over windrows, um, uh, trying to mulch through the windrows, mulching stubble at the moment's probably not the best option for a couple of reasons. One of them being, being um, we'll cover later on, with stem rot spores being spread around the place. But, but um, uh, yeah, so just it's, it's a matter of doing something, I suppose, and, and trying to get it going. Um, now, if we do run into wet ground, we're not locked into varieties. Um, so we, there are options for later varieties. And uh, as John said, it's, we'll address those sowing windows in a little while. Um, and, uh, and then what do we do with nutrition? If, um, if we can get it to a point where we can, it's actually the seed bed's not too bad, but we can't get back in and, uh, and put nitrogen um underneath well uh, what do we what do we go that we'll um we'll also address that one in a little while if we can't actually uh and you know spread the phosphorus on top and and uh, and then work nitrogen in um do we have options there we're we better off to aim for a decent sowing window and talk about nutrition later uh or we're we better off to make sure that we get everything prepared 100 percent and and uh, and sow a little bit later so um we'll also uh, address that in a little while um, I'll throw it out to everybody. Has anyone got any comments, thoughts, queries, uh, questions? They've, they've hit an absolute roadblock and they don't know where they're going. All right, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll keep going on to, uh, on to the drill sign scenario. Just before we go from there, Mark, just in regards to the layouts and if you did drill so this year, obviously it's an opportunity to go to aerial sowing, like if you had drill sowing last year, it's an opportunity to go to aerial sowing this year. So obviously that um, uh, is for, um, you know, mixes our herbicides up and a different uh, spectrum of weeds we're chasing. So that's also an opportunity and particularly when um, water saving isn't a priority this year. So there's plenty around. So do consider that if you did drill so last year to swap over to aerial. Aerial also brings us a little bit closer in the window, which we will address in a tick, um, as in you, you can um, uh, solve it later in the window without, you know, you know, still hit the PI date at the right time. So, but it is a good comment about that pre-germ. Um, pre-germ particularly under uh, challenging conditions it will will um will almost invariably give you a better result than flying dry cd just think, on um, that sorry just sorry. on that um if you're going to swing to aerial book it up with your contractor early because they're pretty busy at the moment mm, fair comment. Yeah. Uh, i think you also have the opportunity to to do it the other way around as well if you aerial sowed last year thinking about drill um obviously snails are going to be a massive issue as everybody would know so mm. just sort of have those things at the back of your mind if your layout does allow you to go between sowing methods have that sort of if you can get on um just moving into the drill part of things so i guess we are in this point where if you have managed to actually burn your stubble uh you've got to sort of then weigh up if you've sort of got wheel tracks or not within your fields if you're sort of not, don't have wheel tracks, you have the opportunity to certainly drill straight in because you don't need to do anything. Um, whereas if you do have wheel tracks, it's this idea that we do need to do a bit of a light cultivation um, just so that we can get rid of those wheel tracks because we all know how important it is with that second flush to get the water off. Otherwise you're gonna run into all sorts of problems. In saying that though, as well, if you did manage to get a really good hot burn and you do have plenty of ash lying around, there's obviously risk that the stomp will get tied up in that ash instead of doing what it's supposed to when you do the three-way mix. So just be mindful of that. Think about sort of what you've got within your chemical toolbox to sort of get around that and still keep on top of your weeds. Um, the other question sort of is around if we are drilling straight in, if you've got um, 
a disc versus a time machine, you know, if you are wanting to sort of open that soil up a little bit because it is still waterlogged from the winter time, perhaps a tine is an option, but just obviously being really mindful of, of seed sink, definitely. Uh, whereas if you are in this position, then when you do have wheel tracks in your paddock and you can't get on the ground because it is still way too wet, um, you know, you, you get back to that uh, decision around, do I delay sowing, potentially change variety, or do I then look to, to aerial sow in, in that regard? Uh, has anybody got any, like, is anybody that has not drill sown or drill sowed last year and wanting to drill sow this year again? Does anybody have any comments around that? I did have a grower that was thinking about, he did manage to get a really hot burn, which was really good. Um, but in terms of being able to get back on that field to work through some wheel tracks, his idea was around potentially rolling the, the paddock. And so I am interested to see in terms of what some growers have in terms of implements, in terms of what their light working potentially could be, um, just to obviously get rid of that ash, but also deal with those wheel tracks. Has anybody got experience with uh, implements, etc.? Everyone's listening to the Ryan Annabelle. Yeah, clearly. 89 yeah. people, they don't want to talk to me. <laughs> hey there, Annabelle. Um, I, I usually try and bust mine open with a linkage chisel plough because it's nice and light and can handle a little bit of trash if it has to. But the only downside when you start doing any sort of light cultivation is you normally need a grader board, it, which is going to be the problem. Um, I did get some ground grader board a couple of weeks ago and it was speed till and only speed till was only just getting through it. Um, and but we were still able to get that ground to dry out on the top couple of inches and just go to light grader board. It came up really well. We did it twice. So, you know, he only had a look at yesterday. Um, the sun came out. It was a beautiful day. I actually got back out and ploughed some of the country that I power harrowed last week in the mud with that chisel plough. So Obviously, it's wet again today, so it's wrecked that. But um, yeah, we're not in July anymore. So, and I think the other thing we've got to remember is it's only the 21st of September, which, yes, clearly we like to be doing ground prep now, but the facts are we can't. But technically, we've still got about eight weeks. So, um, you know, of a sowing window with, with different varieties. So, I don't think it's, it's certainly not panic stations, but. Um, yeah, it's good that we're discussing it, but to say there's no options is wrong. There's plenty of options, but um, I still think predominantly the best one is to wait for, for a bit. And then um, if you've got to swap between drill side to aerial to get some in, you know, you may have to start doing that if you've got a regional program and then you might be able to swap back. But um, yeah, there is options out there. But the other thing is we've got to try and do it without spending, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars on buying all new gear and because there's no real magic bullet. You know, if you go power harrow, it's not exactly um, a perfect science. You can't power harrow then, then drill so, it's too unlevel uh, and too wet, obviously. So um, yeah, it's just a matter of uh, probably hurry up and wait, be yeah. patient. That's a good point to make though, Peter, with, um, you know, just given the last few days, the days are getting longer with the 21st of September, temperatures are rising, um, you know, once you open it up or, or, or just stir it up a little bit, within a few days, you really, you've dried out that couple of inches you can do something with. So, um, yeah, that's my biggest one, Mark. I, um, I mean, it's no good when you're going to get 10 or 20 mil after it, but if you can see a clear path, I've had it plenty of times where you're out there in mud. And, but if you can drag a time through that, you know, I've been speed tilling, you know, five, six, seven days after that initial, um, you know, you think you're destroying the paddock, which obviously it's not ideal, but um, the, the speed up it gives you to get your paddock to dry out is incredible. So, um, yeah, you can make a lot happen quickly if you actually bust that stubble of, you know, the paddock open. So is there is there any concern then, I mean, depending on how close we get to paddock preparation and the, the right sowing window in terms of if we are doing that sort of final grade, are we worried about seed sink at all then when we go to sow? 
or would it more be around if you get to put your get to actually do grade it like you know four weeks in advance say versus a week before well for me I, I'm not overly worried but you may go a little bit shallower but usually when you get a rice on rice situation you've still got last year's roots in there which seems to hold your soil structure together better anyway will just depend on your soil type though yeah yeah um mark do you have any uh, other comments to add this is probably your bread and butter <laughs> From the drill saying point of view, you mean? Yeah. Oh, look, it's it's uh, no. I think you've covered pretty well. It, that's you know, it's getting that ground. Uh, it's important to just not to lock yourself into a program. I think it's be a bit flexible with both your uh, your sowing program, but also your herbicide program. There is options out there. Um, regardless, with drill saying, particularly rice on rice, um, you've got to. You know, you can't have that water. To, to get proper establishment, you don't want that water ponded, uh, particularly on that second flush, first flush too, but second flush. Um, so if your ground isn't up to that point where you can drain at 100%, then, um, you know, then sort of weigh up what, what the best option is there. So, um, again, we'll come back to sowing windows, as, uh, as John said, but um, you do need to have a little bit early with your drill sowing. So... Um, uh, but it does give you further options. Snails, as you said, they're certainly going to be a big issue. Herbicide program, we've got some level of flexibility with, and there's lots of options out there. Um, um, and nutrition is, uh, you've probably got a little bit more flexibility at a drill sowing program, uh, but it's more important to get your crop on, crop in on time. Uh, and um, these other things we can sort of cover the bases on a bit later on. Uh, all right, let's move to varieties because I'm sure plenty of people still have questions about this. Uh, you want me on this one? Well, I don't mind, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we did. Um, so this question came up. We obviously we had a, a series of grower meetings just um, a few weeks ago and um, of the 220-odd growers that attended them, that uh, probably the biggest question was uh, what varieties can we put on stubble? Um, so just as a general rule of thumb, we are allowed 2% admixture in, uh, in our varieties that we put in, and except for your short grains. So if you're putting in short grains, basically the admixture is, you know, bugger all, uh, next, next to nothing. So particularly with Koshi, that's our premium variety. So if, if we're putting in Koshi, that's either got to go into clean ground or Koshi stubble. So um, so they, they, we can't handle any admixture with Koshi at all, including, uh, including Opus. Um, however, just general rule of thumb, any medium grain can go on any medium grain stubble. So any of the bold medium grains, uh, 71 is EPN uh, or Sherpa. Uh, Sherpas are the same value this year. And um, so they, they, they can all sort of uh, go on a, a, any stubble. With your short grain stubbles, Opus and Koshi, uh, with Opus, we can put Opus back in, obviously, uh, or Sherpa. Uh, Sherpa's a smaller grain than your bold medium grains. Um, recommended not to put bold medium grains, so your 71 Rizik the end, uh, into Opus stubble, but Sherpa into Opus stubble is fine. As with Koshi, uh, Koshi Opus is fine into Koshi stubble, um, and Sherpa again. Again, prefer Sherpa above not bold medium grains. For that. Um, for those in the north, the, the long grains, uh, pretty well any long grain can go into any long grain stubble. Um, given the wet winter we've had, the, you know, the chances of huge carryover of, of admixture, you know, of, of last season's variety is, is not going to be huge. And then on top of that, if we get a half decent burn and we work that ground, it's going to be even less. So, um, um, you know, so it's a bit of horses for causes with, with the paddocks, but, uh, you know, use, use your sort of, um, you know, your own sort of discretion of that. Um, also fine to put medium, uh, medium grains on the long grain stubble, but we don't want long grains onto medium grain stubble. So long grains need to go into either long grain stubble or clean ground um, just on top of that. So as I said, a hot burn, cultivating fields, uh, given the wet winter we've had, um, 
And um, probably one key point is if we had a lodged crop the year before, the likelihood of a lot more grain on the ground is higher. Um, so preferably put the same type of rice back into that if you if you uh, are going in same variety, you know, ultimately, but certainly the same type of rice. So bold, medium grain, medium grain, um, short grains, long grains, whichever it might be. Does anyone, have any yeah, does anyone have any questions on that? Just we have had lots of people ask around Sherpa 71 stubble, but it would just be so everyone knows if you grew 71 or Razik or Sherpa last year, you have the ability to grow any of those varieties on that. Yeah. Cool. Uh, all right, sewing windows. Uh, Brian, I would love to handball this one to you. <laughs> Yep, no worries, Annabelle. So our sowing windows are, are based on getting microspore and flowering at the time where we have the least probability of getting cold temperatures. So that doesn't mean you can't get high yield sowing earlier or later than the sowing window, but this is sort of the recommended time for the maximum potential of, of not getting cold. So you can see uh, from the different windows there for the different sowing methods, when we take water away from growing rice so when we drill so or delay permanent water the, the longer the growing period so rice loves to grow in water so that the quickest maturing is in aerial sowing so we can sow that late so as as was said earlier if you're starting to run late you're starting to get problems it, there's always the opportunity to to go to aerial sowing or dry broadcast and you're still in that sowing window the other thing that's important here is that um once you get out of that sowing window, you probably you probably realistically got at least a week after these windows, and you're still you know quite happy. But once you start to get past that, you really need to look at the varieties that have got the best cold tolerance. And from talking with um, Chris Proud from University of Queensland, who does a lot a lot of work on cold tolerance, he tells me seventy one is as good as Sherpa and potentially better. So the, the best two varieties for cold tolerance are VO71 and Sherpa. And then the, when you step down from that, you're looking at VN and Opus. So the ones you really don't want to be growing later than the window are the long grain. So particularly Dungara and Topaz, they're really sensitive to cold. And so when you get out of the window, you're really running a really large risk of um, getting cold damage and reducing yield. So last year we had, just for a bit of an example, we had two experiments where we sowed them later. So at Geraldry we drill sowed, or Ben, ben from Rappel drill sowed for us, 14th of October and the 10th of November, so split sowing. And there was hardly any yield difference for Rizik and 71 between those two dates. But we didn't have those cold temperatures which, which knocked the potential off. And also at Colliamble, we had an experiment as well. That was sown the 9th of November with permanent water 16th of December. And that um, we still got Rizik yield at 13.5, BN 14.5, sorry, 71, 14.5, and BN was 12.8. So VN is a good option for going later, but you um, have to remember its lodging potential. And the other thing is when you start to go later, we'll talk about nitrogen in a bit. When you start to go later than your window, you probably need to consider cutting your nitrogen rate back a little bit because you, um, the higher the nitrogen rate, the longer the development of the crop and the, the higher, the more cold sensitivity as well. So just a few things to, um, so any question on varieties? Or oh, just on VN, you said about it's lodging. So you're just recommending drill sowing or if, if it, uh, someone wanted to aerial sow it, is there like reduce the seeding rate or anything, or what we uh, think there to reduce the lodging potential? Yeah, it's a bit risky aerial sowing the end. Um, if you had the Sherpa option, unless you're going really late, unless you're going sort of getting into that sort of December type period, you'd probably um, be thinking up to mid November more Sherpa than the end and cutting the nitrogen rate back a little bit. The, um, 
it does. Yeah, once you start to get a reasonable yield, it can fall over pretty quickly. Can I just ask the question is um, a lot of the, the decision will be made on the weather this year, whether we could change varieties quickly and is there enough seed available? Uh, short answer is yes. Um, uh, you know, we'll cross the bridge when we come to it, but basically yes. Yeah, so changing varieties is a, uh, certainly an option and we, um, we have uh, probably more seed of most varieties than we've had before. Um, I'll just put a little caveat with the, the end. We've, we've got probably three times more seed than we've had before at the end. Um, but if it all pushes, you know, right into that late window that, uh, and the end of huge demand, well, a different story. But yeah, short answer is yes. We've got, we've got heaps of the flexibilities there. Yeah, we've got a long way to go yet. Yes. Yeah. So how far out of the sowing window can you go before you just shouldn't grow that variety or grow rice in general? Is there a Is certain that, cut-off date? Dependent on the growers, um, personal um, acceptance for risk, really. Um, like I'm, I'm happy for a week to 10 days later. I don't think there's a really big risk, but once you're starting to get past that, um, it's really up to the grower as to, to what their aversion to risk is. And, and also, is it only a small part of their whole crop or you know, you, you're not gonna, so a massive area well outside the window because you're exposing yourself to really, really large risk. But it might be just one paddock, your last paddock or something like that. But yeah, seven to 10 days to me is about as far as I would probably push it. That's an uh, excellent question. There's been, um, you know, every year, particularly where we've got water like this, it's very tempting to put in that last paddock. And as Brian said, if that's, you know, 10% of your whole crop, well, it's worth a risk. Um, we have had good results, you know, and, and good being, you know, reasonable results of, of very late crops, uh, but that risk is a lot higher. And we've also had some, um, you know, some stories where, well, basically we're almost still harvesting some of those very late crops from last season. So, um, so yeah, there is a point where it's too late and, uh, and just, as uh, somebody said before, take a take a bex and a lie down at that stage of the game. So, and um, we're getting into mid December, and we've got water everywhere, and we've got that paddock prepared. And um, you know how much risk do you want to take? So, um, if we're heading down that path, and and uh, you know end of November, early December, and we're looking at that last crop of the end that we want to play with, um, uh, you know go if you like, but limit your expectations. Uh, don't, don't aim for a 12 ton crop and end up with a crop that's flat on the ground that you're harvesting at the end of June. Um, you know, aim for that eight ton crop and uh, and you'll probably use seven megs of water for that eight ton crop and it's still a reasonable result. So, um, yeah. But there's certainly a point where it's too late. How many um, flushes would we go to before or how quick, if we drill sowing, how quick can we go to permanent water? What's the minimum number of flushes we'd have to do to get there? If you've got a good layout, um, and it, you know, it's really um, pretty flat, you get good even water depth, really, uh, you can go permanent water when it's a couple of leaves, when it's out of the ground, just as long as you get shallow water on it. Um, it still uses a bit of the seed reserve early on, so, um, yeah, it's not really a problem. It's all about um, not drowning it. Sometimes when it grows out a bit bigger than that, it'll actually be a bit harder for it to transition from, from being um, aerobic to anaerobic. But that's a good point there is that um, if you are drill sowing, the, the sooner you go to permanent water, the shorter the growth duration. So you definitely, you're late sowing, you definitely don't want to be delayed permanent water. And um, and if you're a bit late, normally it's a bit warmer too. So you're getting into that November period, you're getting warmer days, it grows quicker, it handles, it handles the water better. So um, not sure if that answers your question, Phil, but um, you can go pretty early just as long as you don't have too deep of water. No, that's good. Um, would we change, change um, the agronomics of that with um, 
when we do herbicide applications or I guess the if if we get the triple mix on afterwards and then then it's about um, getting getting the nitrogen as well. Your yeah, nitrogen will be fine as long as it's on dry soil because it'll it'll go into the probably not I mean it'll wash into the soil and attach the clay particles. Um, herbicides is um, Malcolm. Well, if you've got the three-way mix on and uh, you are going to actually have early permanent water, it may be that you get away without anything else. Uh, it's a case of monitoring and, and uh, uh, applying things as required. The, uh, if you then start to use the late post treatments like the Jigsa and Aura, uh, you need to be mindful of trafficability, but also um, drift hazards. Phil, are you just put some clarification around that. Are you talking about a, a later crop, you know, after winter crop, or are you talking about a, a crop that you, you know, a, a long season crop that you you may be delayed in getting it in? Uh, no, just rice on rice. We've got we've got a bit of fallow ground which isn't perfectly ready either. So I mean, um, it's it could be either or either. Like my other question would be, how much? risk is there going straight in drill sown onto rice stubble i guess that was um somebody answered that question earlier with um regard to ponding if you have any low spots the crop's going to struggle if if it doesn't dry out yeah yeah just to, to add to brian's point about the nitrogen side of things um uh, last season we had people having a um uh you know a bit of a panic about getting nitrogen on early and uh, to the point that they were sort of compromising getting the ground conditions. So the crop was up, uh, they wanted to put permanent water on, it kept showering rain, it, it, uh, it was windy, they couldn't get the spray window on right and so on and so forth. So, and they ended up putting nitrogen onto wet ground and filling up um, and, and came and stuck later on. So you know, I don't know what your readers have at the moment, but if we're still talking red 1500 bucks a tonne, um, that, uh, that's, uh, you know, just, it's worth waiting or, or Brian, you got more to add to that just on, as far as that, uh, rushing that window for new, for nitrogen. Yeah. We'll talk more about nitrogen and, and that stuff in a minute, Mark. Oh yeah. Good. Oh, there we go. Well, now, uh, Mark, Mark, I'll just make a comment on, um, direct drilling into, um, Ross stubble is the biggest challenge when it's wet is closing the groove over so yeah when you're with your implement whatever you use is getting that slot closed back over so that's the biggest challenge you you've got to try and judge the, the moisture level within the soil to you yeah, get a good close um uh, for a couple of reasons Mel will talk about the uh, potential herbicide damage to that seed if the slot isn't closed but also it does dry out pretty quickly and it goes very hard i think someone said um this earlier about yeah after our um, rice stubbles are wet. As soon as we get some sun shine on them, they virtually bake. So that is a challenge. That just be aware of that. And Mel, you just want to cover off on the potential herbicide damage to the seed if the slot's not closed. Well, if the slot is not closed, stomp can get to it. Stomp relies on spatial uh, differenti differentiation, so it has to be all kept away from the seed, uh, and that's why we bury our seed before from a herbicide perspective with stomp. So that's important. The other one is a direct drilling into a burnt stubble uh, will leave you a lot of ash and the remnants of um, roots and stuff at the surface, which makes it a tough gig for the three-way mix. It'll still work, but in those circumstances, uh, be on your toes. If you can get a glyphosate on just prior to the three-way mix. So you've sown the crop, perhaps you didn't get on prior to sowing with glyphosate. Just be wary of large barnyard grass. They'll be susceptible to Roundup and then come in um, sort of minimum two days, three days, five days, something like that with the three-way mix. Uh, I've seen that used last year with good effects because it's those large barnyard grass in those circumstances, uh, they're protected by stubble and remnant stubble and ash. 
uh, and they end up being the ones that uh, cause you the most grief. So if you can pull them out with glyphosate, it's quick and it's early. Yeah, well, I've seen similar um, results last year where the glyphosate wasn't used that you're talking about, Mel. I think it is a very, very valid point. Uh, Peter, you had Peter Burke, you had your hand up. Did you want to say something? Yeah, I was just curious. Um, jumping ahead, hopefully we can drill so. Um, so let's say we drill so into some um, straight into a rice double that's quite got beautiful moisture in it. Um, how does that change? Like normally we obviously flush straight after it. And how does that change it if we've got 10 mil coming and we've sowed into a, you know, is that going to be enough rain, rain to bring it up? I know in the past when you're sowing the dry soil and you get 20 mil, you're sort of still better off flushing. Just curious what people's thoughts are on, on that scenario. From my experience, it depends a bit on soil type. Like I know on the heavy grey clays, it takes a lot more to to get it to germinate. But on the red brown earth, um, yeah, you can get 10 or 15 mils and it'll, it'll come up nicely. So I think it's a bit bit variable. Um, but you um, you probably wait till the rain goes and then, um, yeah, give it a week and give it a second flush maybe. You don't want it. You don't want to um, flush it and then a week later get that like a rainfall event on it, which is going to fill the profile up and allow ponding because, you know, that, well, you know, better than I do that critical period, if it ponds between the first and second flush, um, the plants will often die. Any other comments about that from grower experiences? No, all right, we'll move on. So nitrogen, this is a little bit what we are talking about before, what um, Mark was um, alluding to is if we have trouble sowing, we sort of, we feel that you're getting outside the window, you're better off to make sowing on time your preference rather than spending another week getting your nitrogen on. So there are opportunities for putting nitrogen on, on later. So if you're, you're sowing it, you get the crop in, it's established. We'll talk about nitrogen efficiency in a minute, but the, the thing you don't want to do is you don't want to put the water on and then fly your rear into the water when the plants are really small because you get big losses. So your options are that you could you know, wait till it's a month, wait till it's established, you're getting sort of 10, 15 centimetres at height in your crop, then you could dry it down if you had a recycle system. There's no reason you couldn't you know, drop bays off and then spread your air and fill up again. And if you're not willing to do that, you don't have the system to do that, you can just apply your air in a couple of splits so that the plants have to, once the plants start to grow, they, they start to get roots to take up the nitrogen quickly. And they also start to get leaves, which help reduce the, the losses from a volatilization. So the bigger the bigger the plant gets, and uh, the more roots and the more canopy, the lower the losses are to nitrogen. So your best option is to wait until early tillering and then probably put half your, your air on that you're planting. And then a few weeks later than that, put, put another half on. And you might, you might even, if it's a second crop, you might have to go a bit more than what you were planting because you, it won't be as efficient as if you put it up pre-permanent water. So I guess that, yeah, the bottom line is that, you know, when your plants are really small, they can't use the nitrogen. A lot of it will get lost if, if you put it into the water. So, so they're just a couple of options. So prioritise sowing on time if you can. And there are options for nitrogen later on because, we yeah, if it's $1,500 a tonne, you don't want to be losing 40 or 50% of it. And then also if you don't realise you've got that loss and the plant hasn't grown large enough, you've lost yield potential. So you can't make up a big yield difference by PI. If the plant's not big enough by PI, you can not You can only make up two or three tonne in yield at that time. So you've got to put enough on to get the plant growth by PI. So. so just on that then, um, around losses, and if we go to the next slide, Brian, do you mind just talking through what that looks like in terms of you know, obviously we know that 
to get it in pre-permanent water, both in an aerial and a drill situation, is the most efficient way of using that nitrogen. So the other sort of scenarios that growers might find themselves in, if you mind just chatting through that. That's right. Can we just flip to the next one for a second, Annabelle, and then we'll come back yep. to that one? Yep. So the next one sort of all this shows is that um, when, the, when the nitrogen's in the soil, it's attached to the clay particles, it'll stay there for a long time. Once it's, once it's flooded. So any nitrate in the soil, anything like your nitrate, your wheat uses nitrate, your other summer crops use nitrate, that, that gets lost as a gas. So if we have our nitrogen, we either sow it in the soil down seven centimetres or we drill so and when the plants are this high, we put it on the dry soil surface and wash it in. So in both scenarios, the nitrogen, the ammonium is, is attached to the clay particles and it's really quite stable there to be used by the plant. But when it becomes unstable is when you go through drying the soil out and then it gets wet again. Because when you dry it out, some of that nitrogen turns to nitrate. And when it gets wet again, that nitrate's lost. So you start to get those losses by wetting and drying. And then as you can see that big... Um, that, that period there where you've got the volatilization, that's where you're putting the urea just into water. It doesn't, it doesn't go into the soil because it just most of it stays in the water and then it's just volatilizes through those sort of losses. So if we go back up another slide, back up one, please, Annabelle. So, so that's sort of the underlying basis for, for why these efficiencies occur. So you can see there's more efficiencies there on the left when you're prior to flooding you get higher efficiencies of nitrogen. So delayed permanent water is the most efficient because at that time, your plants are this big, you got a lot of roots so that when you put the fertilizer on, it washes into the soil, the plant uses it really quickly. So it's quite efficiently. And if we go to the other extreme where we've got aerial sown surface applied urea, so urea is applied in the surface and you fill up with water. Um, that's not as efficient as the others because some of that you urea is still close to the surface so it has more opportunity for loss whereas if you could drill sow it in the soil five to seven centimeters there's less opportunities for loss so you can see it's 55 percent so the time for the plant from when you put that fertilizer in until the plant uses a fertilizer changes the efficiency and then we step over to mid-season top dressing here you're putting it in the water if the plants aren't real big there's two things. One, the urea nitrogen stays in the water, so it's, it's available for wind blows across and volatilizes, takes it away and volatilizes a fair bit. And the plants aren't very big, so they can't use it very quickly. <clears throat> but as you get over towards PI, the plants are bigger and they've got a, a lot more roots and they've got a lot of surface roots. So PI is much more efficient than sort of mid-season. Mid so that sort of explains the efficiency. So that's why we're saying if you can't get it on before you sow, don't put it in the water straight after you sow. Do a couple of splits once the plant starts to grow or drop the water off and then apply it to dry soil and put the water back on. So there sort of are opportunities there for um, applying a nitrogen without, without really big um, losses in efficiency. Yeah. Any questions around that? Yeah. I had, um, there was a grower last year who, who his crop, he drill sowed and, and the crop didn't look so great. So they thought we should chuck a bit of urea at it um, between a flush. Just wanting to reiterate to please don't do that. Because <laughs> um, as uh, Brian just said, you will, you will lose that. Even if it doesn't look, even if the crop doesn't look like that great. Brian, I don't know if you have anything to add to that necessarily. Yeah, that's right. Because you, um, the same with the with the nitrogen, like we recommend you sow Granulox Z or a starter fertiliser with the seed because that's your cheapest form of phosphorus. But the nitrogen there, every experiment we've done has never led to a yield increase because the same as what Annabelle was saying, you're going through the wetting and the drying cycles. So it's it's changing from ammonium to nitrate and you're getting those losses. So it's sort of inefficient to do that. Brian, just a, a general nutrition question. So going rice on rice, should we uh, increase our nitrogen rate and, and when? 
and um, and just a general comment around phosphorus and zinc. Yeah, definitely. If you're growing rice on rice, you'll need more nitrogen because even even if you had a pasture, there's not normally a lot left for the second crop. So if you had a pasture in the first year, you'll have to increase quite a lot. If it's a crop site, yeah, you'll have to in increase again. I think in the um, the pre-season meetings where we have one of those recommendations, I think it was looking at another um, 30 or 40 kgs of N per hectare. But really, it's um, if you've got some history on your paddocks, is the best option. There was a question in the chat just there about how far out can you pre-drill nitrogen. If the soil... It depends on, on how, if it's going to wet and dry. If you're sowing it into the soil and it's, it's going to remain pretty saturated, you can pr probably go out a week or 10 days. But if you're, I would definitely wouldn't go any more than that. But um, if it's likelihood it's going to dry out, so it's going to go anaerobic and then you're going to fill up and, I'm sorry, go aerobic and then go anaerobic again, when you pond, um, <clears throat> you're going to have greater losses. So like ideally you'd um, less than a week if you can. The other side of that is, is um, that's why we talk about seven centimetres. So for those of my vintage, it was um, the seven centimetres sounds like an odd thing, but that's that's basically the old three inches, um, which was actually before my vintage, just to put that out there. But I, I was of the generation could do both. Um, but the deeper you go, and that's a challenge, obviously, in wet ground, uh, your, you know, your losses are less. Is, is that, Brian, would you... Um, put some clarification in there. Yeah, that's right, because you're, you're not going to have the drying if you're down seven centimetres or so. When um, <clears throat> If the conditions are really good and the soil's dry, you can just go five centimetres, it's fine. But um, once you start to um, yeah, have that variability, the deeper the seven centimetres, sort of there's less opportunity for the soil to dry out. It should stay a similar moisture, so it's sort of beneficial if you can to get to that depth. And we have a question from Nick's iPad. You got your hand up if you want to take yourself off mute and ask your question. Yeah, um, Brian, on that, you were saying, was that with, you know, sowing your rear deep, was that with um, only an aerial sowing or, and I know it's not a common practice, but can you, um, pre if we see a window and we want to direct drill rice in, can we go, you know, how early can we put your rear under and then flush the rice up or is that just not a good scenario flushing rice after you put the urea down deep yeah i wouldn't be um yeah i wouldn't be putting any urea down deep before you drill sowing because you you'll start to get that drying event so you and um you've got a good opportunity for losses so yeah i'd just be waiting until you prior to permanent water and putting it on the dry soil then so yeah i wouldn't be putting anything underneath personally yeah, yeah, just even after, you know, because it could be a really wet year and we're going to try to have some split urea, I was just thinking might be a way to get some early and then, um, you know, just to get a little bit in, maybe 100 kgs and then come back again at before permanent water and then at PI. That that was my thinking, Brian. Yeah, I, th I just think that you're, um, particularly if you have a couple of flushes, yeah. you sort of going to... Yeah, have a lot of opportunity to lose quite a bit of that. Um, and it's going to be quite a while before the plant could actually use it because the plant's got to germinate and establish and, you know, get its roots. So it's sort of that long period. So you've got opportunity for lots of losses and a long time before the plant can take it up. So yeah. Yeah, I think I just, I wouldn't worry about it. I think I'd, it's too risky for, for me, I think, Nick. Okay, thanks. Any other questions around nitrogen? Not a question, Annabelle, but I just want to comment on Brian's uh, talking about drawing the soil down, particularly in aerial sowing crops, you know, get them sown without urea, get them away and then dry the soil off. I know people that haven't done that get very worried about that, that idea of sort of drying your, your crop out. I've actually got a YouTube video for anyone who wants to go on YouTube and look at that. You can see how dry you can let those crops grow they can look almost like they're going to die. And then you put the urea on and put the water back on and they, they do come back. So it's, I, I just, 
you know, uh, back Brian to that, I think that's an option worth considering. Ideally, you want to get your urea under your crop if you're early sowing, but if you can't, there is an option to come back later on, dry the soil out. And even if you don't have the ability to, you know, Brian mentioned, if you, know, if you, if you can't uh, reuse that water, then you've got limited. But you know, I've seen it done in situations where people didn't have reuse systems. Uh, yeah, they're able to, to juggle water around one way or another and dry country out. So I, I think they really should be thinking about that if they can't get the urea under the crop. Beautiful. Thanks, John. Um, and just read that video as well. We will just pop that in the chat so that everybody has that resource. Troy, is there any more people with hands but, up? Uh, yeah, Peter's, Peter's got his hand up. Yeah, just curious what, John, what happened with your uh, chemical regime for that setup? Because uh, if you've got Audram and Taipan and that, that's not going to hold your weeds if you dry your ground out, I wouldn't think. Just curious what you did there. Uh, well, basically, we used to do it uh, when the crop was had a bit of size about it, so it would be sort of early December. Um, and rarely did we get, uh, because the, the rice by then was really competing very well, so any late um, barnyard grass wasn't anywhere near the problem like the earlier barnyard grass was. And often we didn't see it come back, to be quite honest. Um, Malcolm might want to comment on it, but, you know, we've dried down a lot of crops. We used to do it as a technique to... Uh, uh, handle uh, physiological uh, sterility, and rarely did I see uh, barnyard grass coming back as an issue. So you're more talking about the mid-season droning? Yeah, um, but it's still at a time when you can get the urea on. Yeah, you don't want to go too early with it for that reason, but um, yeah, so we're still talking about sort of December, drying it down in early December. Brian, would you want more urea on before that? Or could you use that as, say, a second pass? Well, with delayed permanent water, you can put all your urea on um, at Christmas and still achieve maximum yield. So I think it's not too late. Um, there is, like John was saying, once the rice gets up to, like, 15 centimetres or so, it's starting to get a bit of a canopy, which helps shade out any, any young barnyard that'll germinate once it dries. So it does compete. And sometimes there's an opportunity if you've got lots of broad leaves, sometimes that drying out gives you an opportunity to come in with MCPA or something with a ground rig as well. So, but it's really, yeah, I agree. Her, um, herbicides and weeds are something you really need to consider before you do it. And, and ideally Malcolm, yeah. you would not. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Michael Chalmers, I did see you pop up. Here, you've had a lot of experience with these mid-season um, drydowns. You got any comments to make, particularly just around the weed management? Yeah, um, thanks, Troy. Um, you no, you're, you're right. yep. Ho hopefully, you can hear me all right. I'm just on the road. Um, yep. Yeah, in line with, in line with what um, with what John Fowler said. Yeah, we've we've done that a lot, and yeah, you can you can have it looking, you know, about ninety percent dead, and it's still growing roots and developing a root system, and it and it comes back. Amazingly quickly. Um, approaching school zone. And um, yeah, I, I wondered the same thing when when John made that comment. I wondered the same thing as Peter. Do you need to do a um, basically a sacrificial first, um, you know, first nitrogen application, and, and then do your dry down for your um, your big application um, around Christmas? Um, but yeah, we've we've found what John said. Um, so basically. Uh, yeah, the weed control's done, the, the grass weed control's done, and, and that dry down is an opportunity to do a, um, a Bassagran MCPA if it's if it's required, yeah, is, is our experience. But, yeah, I, I'm certainly not afraid of, of drying down a crop once it's um, established, yeah. The, the one thing I would like to add there is if you... Um... <clears throat> if you dry it down too much, you're going to stop the growth, crop's growth and delay its development. So if you're late, you, you don't want to make it even later by, you know, it definitely comes back and we've had it where it looks like it's hayed off and ready to make silage out of, but it'll delay the development a week or 10 days. So, you know, you don't want to take it that far if you're late. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that, Brian. And 
Um, pl crops that we've planned to do a dry down on, we've always sown them at least a week earlier to allow for that, uh, which, which may not be an option this year. Just as an aside... Just in there, summary, Brian. Sorry, just know. as an aside, uh, if you are drawing down crops, don't start applying a jigsa followed by a dry down because uh, a jigsa needs a turgid plant to give good, good crop tolerance. If you start getting drought stress after the jigsa application, you can get more injury. Good point, Mel. So yeah, just to clarify, Brian, about the nitrogen in a dry down situation, you're happy for it to all go on then, is that right? Yeah, that's right. I think um, if you, ideally a dry down early, early December, like I wouldn't be waiting to too late. And from delayed permanent water, you know, we know we can put all the nitrogen on pre-permanent water a couple of weeks before PI and still reach maximum yield because it grows the plants. Um, <clears throat> well, two, two things. One, you're putting on dry soil, so it goes straight to the roots and the plant has got good roots, it's got good um, biomass, it just grows incredibly quick. But I would be looking at doing it early December if, if you um, have that option and don't dry it out excessively, just dry it so you've got you know, three centimetres of dry soil so you can get that urea on and fill it back up. Are there any other questions around mid-season dry down, urea, nitrogen, phosphorus, anything at all? I am conscious that it is nine past nine. So for those of you who uh, need to drop off, feel free to. Um, we've got sort of one little section left, um, and thank you, Matt. He's just popped that video link in the chat um, that John Fowler was talking about. It's a great video of John talking directly in front of camera, so that's always good. Um, so, so, so yeah. Annabelle, I've, I actually yeah. have got a question just yeah. around nutrition, and maybe yeah. John Fowler, hoping you can answer it. So if we can't get on our, our ground um, to do, you know, put some zinc um, fertiliser down, what's our options with... Um, some liquid zincs and that sort of stuff. John, could you, I know you've done a bit of work on them. Could you talk us through our options there? Uh, yeah, you're stretching my memory now, Troy. Look, um, basically zinc on the seed really tends to do better in aerial sound situations than zinc mm -hmm. on the fertilizer. So uh, applying uh, you know, one of those um, zinc seed treatments is, is well and truly an option. And in fact, I think it's a very good option to consider. Um, and so I'd, I'd have no problem with that. I, I would have a problem putting just broadcasting phosphorus. Um, my concern with that is if, if you broadcast phosphorus and you get uh, clear water, that's a good recipe for slime. Um, so I'd, if you're wanting to use phosphorus, uh, it really needs to go under the soil or you, get, or you can be generating a, a slime issue. Um, and you're probably not going to like my next comment, Troy, but it might be a season where you can drop the phosphorus out. Now, I know you didn't, don't like that concept, but uh, you can only do that if you do know what your P levels in your soils are. Um, there's plenty of times when we don't get a, a yield response to phosphorus. We put it in on rice because we don't want to deplete the soil pre-reserved because the rice will take phosphorus out. But, but rice has access to phosphorus that other plants don't because of the change in the chemistry when it's anaerobic. Um, so if you know your P levels in your soil, it may be that you can not use phosphorus under your rice this year, and it just it means you're gonna to have to buy extra phosphorus at some point in the rotation to replace it, but you may not need to put it on. But if you don't know your P levels, that becomes a bit, of, a bit risky. And just if we're pre-soaking or pre-germinating our rice seed, um, John, so you're happy for just the, um, the zinc to be poured in as part of that, or how would you do it then? Or would you do it up the auger as you're loading the plane? Yeah, just have you had some experiences, commercial experiences with uh, applying the, um, the zinc to the seed? Uh, yeah, uh, look, um, Adam Delway's had got more experience than me on this. If, I don't know if Adam's on the line. Um, but certainly uh, you can apply it up the auger as, as, you, as you're sowing. Um, uh, from memory, that's how we did it. Uh, there's a few different uh, zinc treatments around. Uh, you pre-germinate your seed first or else you're going to wash it all off. Uh, yeah. 
Just clarification, uh, John, on that phosphorus where you, you're talking, you know, opportunity to leave it out. I assume you're just talking aerial saying in that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Look, if you're getting on there with a drill, it's a different situation. Um, but if you're aerially sowing, you just don't want to um, broadcast phosphorus and then fill up because you've got your phosphorus right up the top. Uh, and quite often, um, if you're going into a situation where there's a fair bit of dry organic material, you'll have clean water. If you've got clean water and phosphorus, you'll end up with green slime everywhere. Hmm. Um, we just had a question around the 071 um, in this girl's experience. It was slower to ripen for him. Uh, and the question being around, would it be actually better to sow at a lower nitrogen rate and then top, top up more at PI to avoid a late harvest? And could the same be said for later sown crops? Brian, have you got a bit of an answer for that? Yeah, the um, nitrogen pre-permanent water does extend your crop growth more than nitrogen PI and that's fine as long as you've got enough biomass by PI so there's only so as I said there's only so much you can make up at PI so you, you have to have you need to have that nitrogen uptake at PI at least 90 preferably 100 and um, otherwise you've, got, you've already lost yield potential so yeah it's sort of your compromise is you have to have enough and then you can top up at PI. All right, any other questions around this? Otherwise, we will move on. Very good. Uh, perfect. Uh, so just in terms of weed and pest management, I will get Mel, if you don't mind, to talk about uh, herbicides in a second. But in terms of some of the, the pests that we will be probably likely to experience this year, there were quite a few people that did experience leaf miner in paddocks last year in aerial sown crops because it was quite a cool, wet start. Uh, I think obviously everybody would be sitting here thinking it'll be probably quite similar. So just be really mindful that you may come across leaf miner in your paddocks and if so, talk to your agronomist about what you can do there. Uh, snails, again, we have touched on snails. They will definitely be prevalent, particularly in aerial sown crops again. Uh, and then just this idea around stem rot. So if you are planting rice on rice, we do obviously recommend to get a hot burn, maybe challenging in this year, um, but because that will actually allow the, the growth of this, I can't say the word, the scler scler I, Troy, you need to help me out with this word. <laughs> scler scler Sclerotia. Yeah, that, thank you. <laughs> um, so by getting a hot burn, that will eliminate those. But if you obviously can't, you know, if you do mulch your stubble and then try and burn, you will run into a few problems there. It is more prevalent, particularly uh, in, in Sherpa that we found. We don't really have the data for VO71 yet. Uh, but if you do come across any stem rot in your paddocks this year, please give Rice Extension uh, a call. We would love to come out and have a look and just get a bit of an understanding about that. Uh, but otherwise, Mal, I will just quickly throw to you. It might be good to just quickly touch over the stomp tie up for drill sown um, and also what people can sort of do in this sort of year in terms of what is in the chemical toolbox for a wet year and getting onto ground. Right, uh, you'll have to spell quickly for me. Um, early, burn, early barnyard grass germinations are the ones that cause us the most grief. And as I said before, they're germinating now. So using knockdowns prior to flooding is really, really useful. Uh, and very economic. So that's a critical one. Uh, don't expect a cultivation to give you a kill with the amount of soil, uh, seed bed moisture around. Um, treat in water seeded rice, getting the bloodworm treatment on the day of sowing is critically important, uh, particularly with uh, pre germinated rice. You don't want the bloodworms there We're just waiting for a feed when you throw some nice plump rice seeds with a little endosperm, uh, a little root coming out, a radical coming out. So get your bloodworm in on time. It's the ideal opportunity for grass control. So Audram or Magister at that timing becomes important. Uh, with uh, Dirty Dora control, be mindful of the drift hazards of uh, MCPA, Basquiat M60 and the Jigsa. If you've got to go to a post-emergence spray to clean up any dirty door escapes. And that's why satin, 
applied uh, from one and a half lease stage on is pretty darn handy there because you can deliver it into flood water without atomizing it. So having Saturn in the system, that's an opportunity to deliver um, eubenic at the same time. So we've got two basic programs in water seeded rice, one for aquatics, one revolving around Taipan, which can go in with the uh, Audram or Magister, or uh, coming back uh, at the two, leaf, two let's say three leaf stage with a satin eubenic treatment. Those are very good treatments. And they enable you to treat water seeded rice without the drift hazards. In drill zone, we've talked about the problem of too much uh, organic matter at the surface. Having said that, the three way mix is by far the best treatment uh, for picking up both uh, grass weeds sedges and broadleaves. It doesn't last forever, but uh, we're not interested this year, particularly in delayed permanent water. So uh, a three-way mix is going to do a pretty darn good job. It'll start to uh, fall over by about the 20th day after application. The uh, Provided you've come up with a clean seed, seabed at the outset, that three-way mix will work splendidly. If you've got larger barnyard grass surviving, that's when you'll end up having to come back with a more expensive post-end treatment. If you can't get the three-way mix on before the crop emerges, well, tough. Come back, drop the grimoxone out and come back with a two-way mix as soon as you can. Uh, you'll still get a pretty good result. You just may miss some of the earlier uh, germinating barnyard grass that the uh, grimoxone would have picked up. We'll get rapid fills this year um, because of the, the um, soil profile being wet, so that shouldn't be a drama. Um, that's pretty much what I had to say. Any questions? Now, I'm just, just uh, around broadleaf snails, bloodworm, um, rapid fills, the importance of that, uh, particularly gum rice and rice. Oh, just that uh, if you can fill quickly, then that's less time for uh, snails to multiply, bloodworms to multiply before the rice gets there. It's a race, uh, and the uh, you want once the rice has got to about two leaf stage, it's pretty tolerant of bloodworm at that stage. Um, as for snails, we don't have any easy answers. I sometimes wonder whether you're better off treating before you flood uh, around the tow furrows with some copper sulfate, but no one's ever done any work, I don't think, to, to show whether that would work or not. Oh, just on that, Mel, plenty of people have hang, hung an old sugar bag with copper sulfate at, at each stop. So when you first start filling your paddocks, yes, it runs around the tow furrows. Yeah. does a bit of a job there. Um, so, yeah, people have done that. So it's the start of your channels as well uh, if your channel's been wet or, or winter it's an opportunity well, just sure, to make sure i don't have sulfate in, in some sugar bags and hey so i'll say, make sure i don't have sugar in the tea yeah, on a rice bowl. Yeah. um mal we did see a little bit of uh a damage from the three-way mix last year uh particularly magister obviously we know it does bleach the crop when if like if you if you really can't get on what what should you do because obviously trying to just you know, if the crop started coming out, where, where sort of, when should you not apply the chemical anymore because the, the plant has come too far out of the ground? Okay, well, with the paracot component, so the gramoxone component, once you've got a one full leaf, you'll start to really damage the crop because you can burn off that initial coleoptile and it'll keep coming. As for the magister and stomp components, there's no concern, just get them off. Uh, the later you go with Magister, the more bleaching you'll get. Well, they still survive. Yeah. So um, it's just take a pair of sunglasses with you for the next week. <laughs> Do we have any other questions from any growers around weeds? Now, did you mention um, the um, stem as, an, as another um, 
Oh, sure. So if if you no, no, option, option yeah, yeah. if things have progressed on and you can't get on the field and you've got advanced barnyard grass in there, where you can still go with, with the magister and stomp components, you can sw switch to stam. That's a very expensive switch to make, and stam's good to about two and maybe three leaf stage rice. So it's three leaf stage barnyard grass, after which it's not much cop. And or you could use massive doses. Uh, from three leaf stage onwards, you can use a jigsaw and you can mix stomp with a jigsaw. Don't mix magister with a jigsaw because it seems to antagonize it, certainly gives you more injury. But uh, if things have progressed and you didn't get on, you can switch to an a jigsaw plus stomp mixture. Uh, again, you could start thinking then about drift hazards. And just with the stam, what sort of temperatures are we looking for before we... Oh, you need a minimum of 23 degrees for stam to work. So it's a great crop in the... Great herbicide historically in the tropics um, and was never very reliable down here. So just take note of that, which might be difficult to achieve in a cool, wet year. Uh, Peter's made a comment. Satin only on label for pre-soaked rice. What's your comments there, Mel? I know that's what the label that's, says, but... Well, that's true. And uh, I personally think that the dry broadcast seeding is world's worst practice of rice growing. So um, I, it is what it is, this, the label. Uh, and the work was done on pre-germinated rice. Very good. Any other questions around this? Otherwise, we'll move into the very last page and give you all back your mornings. Just one comment, Annabelle. Uh, snails. We, we are nearly guaranteed to have snails this year. It's been a wet, mild winter um, where we're going rice on rice. So be really, really vigilant with snails. Um, often the damage is done before we see them. It's the little pinhead ones that uh, affect the germinating rice. You can't even see that they're there. So, um, yeah, so just be very vigilant about that. Yeah. Uh, we have had a question from Ant in the chat around the yield potential, uh, obviously coming into another wet, cool summer. Um, how is it comparing against averages and is there historical data? Brian, you probably would know the most about this. I think last year showed that... Um, <clears throat> In a cool, wet year, you can still get really good yields. It's just all totally dependent on you um, whether you get cold at microspore or not, which is really, you know, getting it in the right window helps that, but there is just that bit of luck as well. So, yeah, I don't think, um, yeah, because we're at low temperatures at the moment and it could be wet and it could be, you know, only average temperatures throughout the year, it um, means we've got to reduce potential. I'm not Hopefully that answers the question, Ant. Just to add to that, if I may, the, the um, I mean, last year, Western Murray particularly was, you know, 10% above average, so it did a fantastic job. It was a challenging start last year, uh, if we remember, and not as much rice on rice, but um, but it was certainly a challenging start with wind and rain and, and it was cold. Um, so, but... Even then, sowing on time, uh, as year in, year out, is, uh, is, is where you're going to get your maximum yield. So the crops that were sown really early and hit PI early didn't yield as much as those crops that were in that ideal window of that first couple of weeks of January for PI. Uh, and equally, they yielded higher than, um, than the crops that went outside that. So it was that sowing on time that was the big factor. Great. Shall we jump to the last slide, Em? Troy. Very good. Yeah, so just a bit of a summary, uh, a dot point that isn't here, but it was mentioned. Look, there will be a lot of swapping and a lot of area work done this year. So swapping from uh, different um, sowing methods, etc. So it's really important that you talk to your aerial operator, particularly as we said that Mark just said there'll be a lot of snails, so they'll have extra workload. Uh, trying to deal with them so it's all about communication 
with your agronomist and your aerial operator. But yeah, so just in summary, delay um, sowing increases probability of lower yield. So we're still trying to get sown on time. Although less efficient, um, our nitrogen can be met further along into the season. So just don't let that be um, a reason for not to sow on time. Uh, expect higher trash levels and the impacts of this on the step on establishment. So there will be some impacts um, such as slime. So you just need to manage that as well. And be flexible with your chemical toolbox as Mal's just given us a, a brief summary. Um, there is plenty of options out there, but yeah, just going back to our, our decision-making uh, matrix, yeah, there is, there's no one farms the same, no one growers the same. There's all lots of, um, we've all got different situations but there is options. So if you just um, read, look at them a couple of slides and say, yeah, okay, I can't do this. What's my next option? How can I keep on track and really concentrate to get our crop sown on time? That's pretty much it. Yep. Um, and again, this has been recorded and it will come out in the Rice Extension newsletter uh, later today. And it will be a resource, resource on the Rice Extension website as well for anybody that does want to look back at this presentation. We will also probably publish that, well, not publish, but the, the decision matrix will pop that one in the newsletter as well for you all as well. Uh, but thank you all very, very much for coming. We really appreciate it. It's nice to see there were so many people on this morning and we hope you got out of this what you were wanting to get out of it. If you have any questions at all or you're still unsure, feel free to give any of us a call. Um, our numbers are at the bottom of every single rice extension newsletter that goes out. So don't hesitate to, to give, us a, give us a call. Otherwise, definitely, of course, talk to your agronomist. They obviously in the paddock all the time and know what they're talking about and doing. So thank you. And um, yeah, 